Hello and welcome to Real Life Sci-Fi, where we talk about ideas and concepts in sci-fi that have become reality. Yes, science! So, a lot of people usually ask me about my favorite sci-fi films, and my answers usually surprise them. Of course, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Stalker, Alien, and a few other classics are on there, but one choice that usually makes people go, what? Is the 1997 film Gattaca. Oh my god, it's so good, so well shot, so well acted, the set design is spectacular, and the soundtrack is among the best I've ever heard. But this video is not about praising the film, we'll save that for another time. This is about how much of a future Gattaca actually got right. So in the film, people have started genetically engineering their children before birth. This starts off as being kind of a way of avoiding potential disease and illness. I have taken the liberty of eradicating any potentially prejudicial conditions, uh, premature baldness, myopia, alcoholism and addictive susceptibility, uh, propensity for violence. But it also evolves into people being designed beautifully and with people who aren't genetically engineered becoming discriminated against in society. I belong to a new underclass no longer determined by social status or the color of your skin. Welcome to Gattaca, gentlemen. No, we now have discrimination down to a science. As no employer wants to hire someone with a risk for heart failure, for example. That's why we follow Ethan Hawke as he defies the odds, the law, and even his own genetics to fulfill his dream of going to space. It's an excellent, beautiful, well-told tale, and I just love it. The ideas behind it is surely all bullshit though, right? What have you said? Well, as you're watching this video, obviously you know there's more to it. In a 2015 article from the BBC, scientists claim that society needs to start preparing for genetically engineered babies. So are we seriously already there? Well, kind of, but let's go back a little bit. Gattaca was released in 1997, but the groundwork for today's genetic engineering was obviously older than this. In 1978, the UK's Louise Brown made history by being the first ever so-called test tube baby, which laid some of the groundwork for genetic engineering of unborn children. In the years following this, the concept of designer babies was founded, babies genetically modified for beauty, intelligence, or to be free of disease. The realization of this took decades, but is definitely becoming reality now. In 2014, cloning pioneer Dr. Tony Perry of the University of Bath was part of a group that successfully edited the genome of mice once the egg and sperm come together. And the sat-nav tells the scissors precisely where to cut um, in the genome, and we inject them at the same time into an egg, at the same time as we inject a sperm, and so that the, the processes that, that naturally would occur in fertilization uh, then enable these scissors guided by the sat-nav to the precise site to work. The genome is basically the genetic makeup of the DNA from the mother and father, so altering it would affect which traits from the parents the baby would get. So it may seem like altering a human genome might still be science fiction, but the technology is near perfection. Dr. Perry tells the BBC the following, it's approaching 100% efficiency already. It's a case of you shoot, you score. All right, so let's get into how this amazing science works, and you might not believe it, but this shit is real. So Dr. Perry and his crew made use of a gene editing technology called CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So if you want to save yourself two minutes every time you talk about this, CRISPR is definitely the abbreviation to go with. What it does is make use of stretches of DNA, which certain bacteria have used to combat predatory viruses by slicing up the viral genome. This DNA is actually called the knife by Science Mag and the scalpel by the BBC. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. So, in other words, these bacteria basically use the DNA as a shank to stab intruders. Pretty badass bacteria right there.
Dr. Perry basically uses a tiny bacterial knife to slice and alter the genome, and I can't be the only one surprised at how strangely basic that sounds. However, this close to 100% efficiency thing isn't necessarily applicable to human genomes. However, we're not far off, as Dr. Perry warned of the complications regarding applying this to humans. The technology exists, but hasn't really been applied to human genomes yet, and this is because their problems aren't so much with science as they are with morals. Now, at surface level, this might seem as exclusively positive, and there's a good reason for this. Imagine being able to remove hereditary health problems, traits of depression, aggression, obesity, cancer. Imagine never having to deal with any of that. Who wouldn't want that for their child? I mean, I'm pretty sure we all would. If we take a look back at Gattaca, the genetically designed society seems pretty peaceful, but it is run in a pretty fascist way, as those who aren't genetically engineered are discriminated against and considered undesirable. An employer will, for example, prefer to hire someone genetically perfect as opposed to someone who has a hereditary history of health problems. This also means that only a privileged few will be able to design their own babies, while those from poor families will be born the old-fashioned way and probably not be treated with the same privileges as a genetically perfect human. Also, would it really be fair for a genetically perfect human to compete in sports against a person who hasn't had the same genetic advantages? This also brings us to the beauty aspect. Everyone wants a beautiful child, but beauty is in the eye of a beholder. You have specified hazel eyes, dark hair, and uh, fair skin. Who's to say which eye color, skin tone, or complexion is the most beautiful? Would you want your parents deciding that for you? Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Maybe a certain mole, birthmark, or other similar thing is what gives us character. And would it be right to remove those unique aspects? We have these gifts, and we have to decide how to use them. And so that's what this discussion is about. We shouldn't bury our treasure. We should use it for the good, and we have to decide what that means. As you can see, what is seemingly an overwhelmingly positive medical advancement could hold some pretty problematic ethical consequences. How much of our personalities are affected by these negative health aspects? Would Mozart still have been as brilliant as he was if he wasn't bipolar? Would Kurt Cobain have become a musician he was if he didn't have ADD and depression? Would Vincent van Gogh still have painted the masterpiece Starry Night if he didn't suffer from mental illness? Do our genetic problems give us artistic advantages, and would we be destroying future art by trying to be genetically perfect? How much of who we are lies in our imperfections? That question is really hard to answer, but very interesting to discuss. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. So you can leave us your thoughts on this topic in the comments below. I'm your host, Sebastian Mendel Martinez, and I'll catch you guys next time. You have to be realistic. With a heart condition like yours. Mom, there's a chance there's nothing even wrong with my heart. One chance in a hundred. Well, I'll take it, all right?